Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations and student leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the importance of supporting and shaping America's future doctors and medical professionals with special guests, Joyce Hendricks, President and Chief Development Officer of the Hackensack Meridian Health Foundation in New Jersey, and Julie Davidson, Executive Director of the Oregon Medical Education Foundation. Julie Joyce, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And and I'm going to uh, set you up. We're going to go uh, first to you, Julie. Um, You know, medical professionals are so important to civil society. If you don't have health, you have nothing. And medical professionals, doctors, nurses, medical technicians, the people who work to support those hospitals and those medical facilities are so vitally important. They also shape Uh, public health policy. They educate us on how to live healthier lives. Uh, Particularly during the pandemic, we saw the incredible impact and essential role that the medical profession has uh, in the United States and globally. So we're taking this National Doctor Day to talk about how nonprofits support medical students. And Julie, could you talk a little bit about the scale of your operation and the work that you do to help us Um, address the doctor shortage in the United States. Sure. Thank you so much, Mark. It's wonderful to be with you today. And also, Joyce, thank you. Um, The Oregon Medical Education Foundation's mission is to help solve this physician shortage by ensuring that our MD, DO, and PA students here in Oregon um, have what they need to not only survive medical school, but to thrive in it, and that all students graduate on time and ready to go and be those fresh reinforcements that we all need. The institutions here in Oregon that provide this have been doing an outstanding job at adapting to the changes of the pandemic in the last two years. But many of those students are still feeling extraordinary stress and in need of that wider network of support to ensure that none of them fall through the cracks. The foundation was started by the Oregon Medical Association 60 years ago, making it one of the oldest organizations focusing uh, on healthcare nonprofit in Oregon. But it was really during the pandemic that a spotlight was shown on the challenges that all of our students are facing, even in a normal year. Um, And so we've been working to raise both funds and awareness within our community uh, to help get the students the help that they need. Um, our core program is, is scholarship-based. It's recognizing the leadership contributions that the students are already making to the field of medicine. But more than just the money, it comes with um, support finding a mentor, which is just an absolutely critical role for in those students' lives, um, and connecting them to safe spaces to handle the mental health and the burnout challenges that they are, are facing um, caused by the pandemic, but also because it's an incredibly stressful uh, undertaking. Um, you know, as part of our wider support for students, too, they have many basic needs that aren't getting met. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later about the food insecurity, housing challenges, and just general financial struggles and stressors that these students are facing. But it's an incredibly competitive field, and many students want to pursue a career in healthcare, but really don't necessarily have that level playing field. So we're starting conversations and developing programs and connections to help those from non-traditional and underrepresented in medicine backgrounds get the edge that they need, get the support that they need uh, to successfully navigate that application process. So if you, um, if you take a look at if you take a look at at the evolution of of public health in the United States. And one of the things that really strikes me is that in, in the early days of our nation, the people who got a medical education were people who could afford it because it's very expensive. And so what you end up with is a group of professionals that are drawn from a very small group of people who have the wealth to afford that kind of trajectory. But that creates a limit on the health of our population, of our communities, right? So Joyce, how do we deal with with that issue of trying to take advantage of the full talent, the full creativity of all Americans in order to ensure that the that the nation itself can be healthy and prosper in a, in a way that finesses that barrier to accessing medical care, to becoming a medical professional, um, how do we deal with this? Is it just a matter of throwing more money at the at the uh, at the problem? Um, well, money always helps a lot, right? But there's so much more that goes into um, you know becoming a, a physician. 
And um, just on Doctor's Day, I want to say thank you to all of the physicians out there in the world that might be listening to this. Um, at the uh, Hackensack Meridian uh, uh, School of Medicine, which is a very new school of medicine, um, it, it just started about three years ago. And um, so we decided to embark upon this journey to create the first new medical school in New Jersey in over five decades. And one of the one of the newest medical schools in the entire country. That is correct. Thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. Um, and it is uh, it is a school based on, you know, no matter where you come from, no matter your ethnicity, no matter your background, to be able to give you that opportunity to become a physician. And then how that helps in the communities is it embraces our, our model of our professional um, roots for the human condition, empathy towards uh, suffering, excellence in medical care, and humility and service. So we're hoping that our diverse um, doctors of today will then connect out in the communities, you know, among students uh, and the community uh, at, at large. So the sensibility is it starts with not necessarily research. It starts not necessarily with the human body, but instead it starts with an idea of service to people. And you are, are trying to establish a school that is based firmly in that sensibility. And in order to serve people, you want to have people who connect to the people that you serve, no matter what their geography is throughout New Jersey or even indeed throughout the United States, no matter what the income level is of, of people, male, female, other, uh, race, uh, rural versus urban, you're trying to create a cohort of people who connect to the service side of the, of the doctor's mission. Absolutely. And one of the ways we're doing that is uh, also our school is based on uh, the Human Dimension Program, which is the cornerstone of the curriculum. And the Human Dimension Program ensures that the students actually go out and work in the communities and meet future patients uh, in the communities. And they may look in someone's refrigerator and say, you're a diabetic, these foods you should not have. So they actually go out and, and meet with those folks, work with them, and on the other side of it, the Human Dimension Program, there is a mindfulness course for uh, doctors to help them also um, make sure that they're handling themselves well, self-care, um, so that they can better take care of uh, patients. So this is all part of our Human Dimension Program. Are we moving more toward a holistic idea? You know, if, if you look at the medical profession, it's not just one thing. And you look at medical schools, it's not just one thing. There are certain schools that are looking for the Nobel Prize la uh, laureate, right? And, and that sort of research intensity. Uh, but in, in your school, uh, Joyce, you're looking at the human service dimension. Uh, Julie, how do you, in, in Oregon, how do you see that balance between essentially two sides of one coin, right? The medical research and the treatment research and so on and so forth, and the human dimension of service where you might be talking about the non-sexy uh, preventive activities like diet or, or uh, mental health and meditation and those kinds of issues. How do you see the relationship between those aspects of the medical profession? Well, that's a fantastic question, Mark. I, and and I guess from the student perspective, they are called to go into medicine. It isn't something that they look at and say, well, I, I could do that. I could get a job there. They feel like they ha they want to give back. And these are the most, uh, you know, some of the most intelligent, um, giving, caring people that I've ever had the privilege of, of getting to to work with. And um, and yet when they get into school, it's um, there's there's still not enough being talked about about how to take care of yourself. There are wellness seminars, but but in terms of, you know, how they are able to first teach themselves how to find that balance um, before they can then teach others and coach others in that, it, it's really difficult. Our students, too, they, they're in the classroom and then they go out into 
uh, into rotation, some of them in much different settings. I say they're going from, you know, downtown urban Portland setting to another rural setting in Oregon. The conversations are very different. The, the, the questions, the, um, you know, where, where their patients are coming from, what their background is, what their comfort level is with physicians is very different. And so we're finding that students have to be these incredible chameleons. And, and the medical schools here, the institutions here are so good at equipping the students to have many of these conversations, but it's still a learning process. And that's where, you know, mentorship really comes in. If students are fortunate enough to find a mentor, they have someone to, to use as a sounding board and, and to help learn and, and guide those conversations better. Um, and, and at the same time, they're learning to take care of themselves too. Burnout is very real among students. And, uh, you know, nearly 50 percent will graduate already having had those feelings. And, and, and that's just really tough. You know, so this is the time for them to be not only learning how to take better care of themselves and, and sustained, uh, sustain their, their energy levels uh, throughout their education. But at the same time, you know, they're, they're trying to help their patients in, in the various communities do the same thing. And so they, they really need um, they really need all the support that they can get to have those conversations. And, you know, uh, we just completed a poll in which we said, what is the top resource that a med student needs while in medical school? And the top answer was uh, financial assistance and scholarships. And the second answer was emotional and mental health resources. But it was really dwarfed by the, the idea of, of financial support. But that really doesn't tell the full story because the financial support might not be just financial support to, to, to support to pay for tuition. It could be things like transportation. It could be things like housing. It could be uh, other aspects. Joyce, uh, how do you divide the needs that students have and diverse students have for your institution? And how do you fulfill those needs? It's uh, that's, Mark, it's a great question. Uh, and Julie, thanks for your, your recent remarks. They were spot on. I have to say that there's the, um, there's the mental health piece, right? Uh, and I know that that's not, um, that is not so much um, cost, but that can turn into cost. So we need to make sure that we eliminate the stigma associated with taking care of themselves mentally and physically. Yeah, right? It's kind of a macho thing that has crept into the medical profession, which I, I don't understand. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to have the benefit, right? I've heard people advocate for this kind of intensity, which is fine, but but the but this idea of some sort of a macho trial by um, by fire to the point of of uh, physical exhaustion, um, it just what other profession requires that? Uh, no, no, yeah. right? Yeah, so you know, it's it's also that that we must pay attention to, um, and again, that's where our human dimension program does address some of that. Uh, and you're, you're right about, you know, housing and, um, you know, and food and taking care of uh, the medical students in other ways. But, you know, truth be told, we must continue to raise the bar on scholarships. It's just it's where you start. Right. Um, it's also not sexy to to say that we're raising money uh, to make sure that that people can get to class or or ha are properly housed. How do you deal with that? Because when you're talking to a donor, I would like to have a scholarship named in my name, right? Yeah. But I don't necessarily want uh, my name attached to um, uh, making sure that people have enough to eat or that they're housed close to the medical uh, facility so that they can actually logistically make it in. Um, so how do you deal with that as, as a fundraiser, professional fundraiser where you're explaining to me that really the need here is a balanced need between the scholarship, but also the living expense? Or do you bundle that together in a program that includes both? Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you think about, you know, going to under your undergraduate and when you get scholarships there, um, you know, there are full scholarships to take care of, um, you know, tuition, not just, uh, I'm sorry, tuition and, you um, and room and board and housing. So there can be those full scholarships to make sure that a, a student is fully supported. And I think we have to start doing much more of that uh, at our medical schools and medical education. We have to treat medical school students exactly like we would treat undergraduate students and ask for full scholarships. 
medical students like we treat undergraduate students. So Correct. in other words, this distinction that somehow at a certain point, certain needs lapse, that's not realistic because we're still human beings and we still have probably the same kind of requirements. That's correct. Julie, how do you, you had referred a couple of times, you kind of kicked that, this idea of the mental health uh, aspect uh, off. Um, are, is what you're saying is that not only do we need to, in our treatment of others, uh, consider the mental health aspects of, of treatment, which I think is gaining more and more acceptance, but also in the education of our doctors, we need to think about the mental health of doctors, of nurses, of medical prof uh, professionals, um, as, as we educate them and as we cultivate them. Yes, and I think that the mental health, I mean, Joyce, you nailed it with, with your word stigma. There is still very much a stigma associated with speaking out, but that's exactly, we need to do everything that we can to, to normalize that conversation and, and to make, create safe spaces for students and our established physicians and PAs to be able to have those conversations and get the help that they need without worrying that they're going to have their license affected by that. Um, you know, and it, it really comes back to, the cost of an education. It is incredibly expensive to go to medical school. The living expenses, the tuition, and the tuition itself has been rising at double the rate of the of inflation, um, which means it's doubling every nine years, which is wild to me that that's happening. There's a tuition-free movement that's starting out, um, you know, where um, there's only seven schools, I believe, that have started that. But, the, you know, the, the scholarships that cover just the tuition and living expenses. Um, we, we need more of those. The, the the conversations around burnout, though, I mean, financial stress is the number one thing that that is weighing on students' minds. Just a generation ago, you know, it was students are graduating with thirty thousand dollars in debt, and now it's over a quarter of a million dollars in debt. Students are putting off travel. They're putting off starting a family and buying a home because they're going to be saddled with this debt for a decade or more. And if they happen to partner up with someone who also has a large debt, I mean, there's so many things that they're not being able to do, and that's contributing to their burnout. And so it's very easy for students and physicians, too, to feel overwhelmed in all of that. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to be an easy solution, but I think it does start with you know, talking about it more and creating spaces for them to, to speak safely and freely. So let me ask you both uh, this question, and if you could also talk about your constituents as well. The, the question that Julie begs, um, if, if medical professionals are exercising careers that are all about the good of people, right, human health, it's really all about whether you're an x-ray technician or um, you're uh, a medical doctor and general pra practitioner, whether you're a nurse or, or some other other person who's focused on human health. Um, this is really about a healthier, better civil society. So we're basically asking people to fund that commitment on their part, right? As if it is an investment in their own income. And I guess it is to a certain extent, but to what extent is this the kind of thing that is just such a social good that together we should collectively uh, try to encourage that through our own investments as a community, either through uh, government programs or through communal programs like this. Shouldn't we be helping people to enter this service um, role uh, to others? And how, how does that work? I mean, can we make, can, can we really make um, colleges and universities free? for those people who have that passion and that skill like they do in other countries. Joyce, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, Mark, you, you bring up a really, really good point. And I think we're doing that right here today with your show, to be quite honest about it, because it is about um, making sure that people are aware. I, I, I can't tell you um, how many people I talk to that really aren't aware of the fact that there's a physician shortage. Um, that they don't realize that primary care physicians are, are lacking, um, that people really don't understand what it's like to even be a physician, um, you know, about the burnout, about people think physicians are God, you know, that, 
that's well, but let's put it let's put a dimension into it because there's no physician shortage in major urban areas for people who are who have good health insurance or who are who have a certain income. There's no physician so shortage there. The that's physician the shortage uh, is is completely in areas that are geographically dispersed. Mm -hmm. And for people who have lower income, and that's pretty much uh, sixty percent of the United States. Yes, I mean yes. it's the vast majority of our country, isn't it? It, it sure is, and uh, it's this is why it's so important to get more medical school students, um, you know, supported and making sure that they're coming from a diverse background and they're going to stay, perhaps in their state or their regions where where they're going to school. Uh, it's just, a, it's very critical. Well, um, Julie, um, going to, to Oregon, Oregon is a great case study because Oregon has um, a couple of urban centers and then it's a vast state. And, and there you also have this whole idea of in certain areas, there, there's a concentration of doctors and medical facilities and hospitals and so on and so forth. And then in vast swaths of the state, there's, there's not very much. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, so that in in shaping your own programs, you're fulfilling a statewide need. No, oh, absolutely. That's a that's a fabulous question. And Oregon is a really interesting and very diverse state uh, when it comes to that urban urban rural divide. Um, you know, the the foundation, the, the Oregon Medical Education Foundation, works closely with the five institutions in Oregon. So we have OHSU School of Medicine, OHSU Physician Assistant Program, Comp Northwest, our DO school, and then two additional PA programs through George Fox and Pacific University. And those five schools go out of their way to pull students in from diverse backgrounds, particularly those who are from rural and underserved and underrepresented in medicine backgrounds to, to create cohorts that or can learn from each other. And then they all have programs too that gets these students out on rotation into those areas and exposes them to the diverse needs of our state and, and really does help coach and equip them to have, to, to better, to best serve those patients. Our scholarships, which is primarily what we, uh, our primary program, you know, helps with it, we give the, the funds to the students for them to use as they see fit. And, and many, and those, particularly the leadership scholarship, you know, works to help retain students for Oregon. We want to support students who are um, committed to staying here and serving in those areas of the greatest need. A major challenge for those students, though, is because of the level of debt that they're having to take on, many of them are not choosing primary care and rural service because they simply don't pay enough to pay down their debts fast enough. They're having, they're almost feeling forced to choose a more lucrative specialty, which means that this gap between phys a physician shortage and not is, is actually, it's, it's, we're not making much ground there. So really trying to support the students who truly want to go back into those communities through the work that we do. And we're seeing, you know, the institutions follow suit. That's that's such a fantastic point. I'm going to bring uh, Tim, uh, Tim Johnston's uh, question into this. Um, he said, um, are there places in medical schools that go unfulfilled each year because of financial concerns? I thought the shortage of physicians was created by limited school capacity. Is that is that true? Is this uh, created by limited school capacity, uh, Julie or or it, uh, or Joyce? Um, uh, some of it is. Yes, I would say yes, because, um, you know, you make it. 6,000 applications for, let's say, you know, 200 spaces in a, in a medical school. So, you know, it's, it's like any other education. So, you know, again, it's why we started a medical school so that, you know, we're able to educate um, more future doctors. So as part of our, our issue is that, um, are we going to, um, to divert um, resources into education for the next level of doctor? Or are we going to um, uh, divert our resources into the specialty that is the highest compensated specialty for direct service so that we can pay off our, our medical debt, Julie? Um, you know, it, isn't that part of the, the issue of the medical debt, right? If you have a medical debt, then you have to go into a specialty that, that pays the most. Education doesn't necessarily pay the most. And so again, we're creating this dynamic through our, our system that seems to perpetuate some of its dysfunction, no? 
Uh, no, that's that's a really that's a very, that's an excellent point, and there is definitely some truth to that. I think to Joy to, to tack on to Joyce's um, response too. You know, we've got to remember we're coming out of two years of the pandemic here, and that limited the number of rotation spots that were available to students. You could not have as many bodies within the institutions in person as you could previously. And so now that restrictions are easing, more spaces for rotations are going to pick up. And really the class sizes, we've seen those diminish over the last couple of years because of the limited number of rotations on offer. I mean, the field of medicine, we talk about physician shortage, it's more than just a shortage of doctors. There's a whole, there's a just a tremendous landscape of roles within healthcare. And we're actually seeing new programs pop up. Our George Fox that I mentioned a second ago just launched a year ago in January with, with an additional number of spots for students. So I think when we look about, we look at who can be filling those needs across the nation, you know, we're looking beyond doctors as well to some of those other really critical roles. Um, but it really, it does come down to finances. And I think that, you know, scholarships help, grants help, there are military programs that help provide the funding for that and and um, can get people in. But I think it really comes to, you know, it really comes down to who are, who are, who is successful in navigating that application process. Joyce was absolutely correct. It's an incredibly competitive process for a limited number of spots. And, and if we're trying to create more of a diverse population in our physicians and PAs and others in medicine, you know, how are we helping those who are from underrepresented in medicine, underserved communities through that process? How are we leveling the playing field for them so that they have an equal shot at, at, at getting one of those spots and, and then, you know, helping to, to, um, to improve that side of it as well, the patient care. Um, the students that I speak with who are, you know, especially, you know, bilingual um, and from, say, a rural Spanish speaking part of Oregon, they, they, they have such an advantage in terms of relating to the patients in those communities. Patients open up and speak to them in a different way. Um, and it's, it's just really critical that patients can see themselves represented in the field. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time, so I'm going to give uh, you, Joy, Joyce, um, um, a word, and then, uh, then uh, we'll go back to, to Julie. Um, I have a question about this whole idea of diversity, uh, because diversity is so often cast in terms of race or, or gender. But to me, I think that some of these points are inclusive of those definitions, but those definitions are just not sufficient. There are also the whole issue of interest in serving rural communities versus urban communities. There's interest in serving uh, people who are poorer versus people who are wealthier. There's diversity in terms of condition, right? There is the preventative side. There could be high intervention cancer treatments or, or low intervention uh, cancer treatments. Um, there are uh, all sorts of different conditions that we all suffer that require a whole set of different skills. How do we change our system so that diversity now is considered in all these different dimensions and that we are creating a system that supplies the talent that is required to make America healthier along a broader front? Right. I don't think that there's a particular one shot answer, but I think that there it is it is true that what we're doing right now is kind of inadequate to the challenge of making America healthier. Joyce, what do you think in terms of this? Uh, and I, we understand we're mindful of the fact that Hackensack has has taken this very courageous uh, step of creating this new medical school. Yes, thanks, Mark. You're absolutely right about um about what you're saying in terms of the, um, you know, the, the different populations and diversity being broader. Absolutely. And I think we have to make sure that, um, you know, we have this, these conversations about, you know, service to the community, right? Serving the rural community perhaps, or, or the urban communities and how that's just as important as getting into a specialty. I think, you know, these folks need to be, uh, Kind of rewarded and um, and praised for that kind of service to the community. They need to feel as good about themselves as you know as one of the the doctors that are doing top research. And we have to begin to have those conversations and and really talk those folks up. They deserve it. We have to break down those hierarchical divisions, for example, between nurses nurses and doctors, or between different oh, sure. doctors, right? 
Absolutely. Because really it comes down to human health. One of the things that that uh, we've just asked is, is whether people select doctors on the basis of race, somebody who looks like them, and gender. What, it was very interesting. Race, nobody answered that they selected a doctor based on race, but gender was a really important issue. So Julie, I'd like to, um, to go to you and, and ask about that whole idea of if we as uh, men, women, people who identify as, as, as other feel that, that somebody of our, um, of our identity um, will be a better uh, service provider, um, how do you ensure that we don't end up with a medical profession where the different types of service providers are dominated by one gender or another so that if we have a condition, we can find a doctor that um, we are comfortable with uh, uh, based on, on our own um, uh, orientation or, or uh, gender identity? How do, how do you deal with that to make sure that there's... No, that's a great question. Absolutely. I think first and foremost, the, the medical students, you know, are, are chosen for, they're, they're awarded a spot because they can care for patients. And being a physician, being a PA, being a nurse, or however you are, you are working in healthcare, you need to be able to first and foremost care for patients. Everything else, I think, comes, comes second to that. And, and being able to have the, um, the flexibility to work with patients from all backgrounds is, is so important. It's, it's a given. Um, in saying that, it's also really important that patients feel like they can trust that relationship and trust that they're going to get the best possible care. There are there are reports still of medical schools, not Hackensack, I'm sure, but other schools that are, are still not giving accurate information about people from other races. Um, there are so many myths, for example, around the black community's tolerance for pain that are just inaccurate and out of date, and that is still being taught in schools. I was so just talking that information, with, with a science leader about the fact that that because of uh, the science and, and how the science has been developed by people with particular lived experience, the uh, blood ox oximeter, the, the, the oxygen uh, measurement devices, um, when they're applied to African-American folks, generally underread the, um, the oxygen uh, content or over, overestimate the oxygen content in the blood. And we have people going home because of how the research was undertaken, simply because of a blind spot amongst the researchers who were predominantly uh, white, right? That's so this, this whole idea of, of how lived experience and how different experiences can inform our research is so important, Julie. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just thought that, that the, the, uh, the example that you were bringing um, really did tie to a conversation just I had yesterday. Uh, no, that's very timely. Thank you for that. I wasn't aware of that study. The lived experience is critical, and and it. But it, at the end of the day, for me, it comes it, it comes second to being able to care for patients. And there's a responsibility for physicians to be able to care for a range of patients. Uh, and yet, we need patients to be able to trust their to trust their physicians and care providers and seek the care that they need. A lot of the um, a lot of the more serious illnesses could be headed off if there was preventative care thought sooner. Uh, so I think that, you know, starting with the medical schools, starting with how we recruit into medical schools, you know, at a very early age, middle school, high school outreach programs, going into communities that have a greater need for physicians and, and helping inspire those talented young kids to consider a career in sciences and healthcare. That's where it really starts. Our grant programs are just beginning to scratch the surface there. There's much more that we could do, but I think, you know, there, there's going, we're in the at the start of a sea change there, but it is going to take a generation or so. I, I still unfortunately think it's going to take that long to uh, to see this really transform to where it needs to be. But there's just some incredible students. My favorite part of my job is to be able to speak with students on a regular basis and hear their stories and hear what calls them into medicine and hear their plans for caring for their communities. And they are just brilliant. And they're, we're going to have a bright future of medicine thanks to them. Well, this is where donors can make a real, real difference of creating a system that helps uh, America be healthy. Joyce Hendricks, President Chief Development Officer of the Hackensack Meridian Health Foundation, New Jersey, and Julie Davidson, Executive Director of the Oregon Medical uh, Education Foundation. 
please thank your staffs, your donors, your doctors, your nurses, your medical tra- technicians, your students, your teachers. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, stay healthy. And, uh, and we're going to be uh, speaking on Thursday about a really interesting topic. We're going to be t- uh, talking about supporting the transgender community and, and some of the issues that are uh, hitting the United States right now. So it'll be a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, tune in. Thank you, Mark. Thank oh, you, yeah. Julie. Thank you. Thank Have you, Joyce. Lovely to meet you.